Okay. I think we've reached a decent enough number so we can uh, begin. Okay. So let me first say hello to everyone out there. My name is Bashan. I am part of the event staff of Politics and Prose. I would like to welcome you to another PNP Live. Uh, before we begin this event, just a couple quick items I want to mention. The first is that if you would like to ask a question of our author, uh, we would ask for you to place it in the Q&A box, which you can find towards the bottom of the Zoom screen, not the chat se section, just to help us kind of keep everything organized uh, for the question and answer period. Also, in the chat section, you'll be able to go uh, find a link which will take you directly to the Politics and Pros website where you'll be able to purchase a copy of Walk With Me. Um, we, of course, highly encourage you to do so, and we would thank you for your patronage uh, as that helps us to continue to bring you these live events. I have the honor of introducing Ms. Kate Clifford Larson. Her biography of Fannie Lou Hamer is the most complete ever written, drawing on recently declassified sources on both Hamer and the civil rights movement, including unredacted FBI and Department of Justice files. It also makes full use of interviews with civil rights activists conducted by the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress and Democratic National Committee archives, in addition to extensive conversations with Hamer's family and with those with whom she worked most closely. Stirring, immersive, and authoritative, Walk With Me does justice to Fannie Lou Hamer's life, capturing in full the spirit and the voice that led the fight for freedom and equality in America at its critical moment. Kate Clifford Larson is the author of a number of books, including Bound for the Promised Land, Harriet Tubman, Portrait of I think Bashan is frozen. Well, I'm going to start. I'm uh, I'm not sure what's happened with um, Bashan, but I'm going to start. You can all hear me. Just someone say in the chat, yes, you can hear me, and I'll I'll start. Okay, great. Um, well, hello, welcome. Um, thank you for coming. And um, I can't wait to talk to you about this book and my work. Uh, it is a, it's been quite a journey for me. And um, she is, Fannie Lou Hamer is an amazing human being. And I feel very fortunate to have decided to research and study her life. So what I'll do tonight is I'll tell you a little bit about myself, um, how I came to to write about Fannie Lou Hamer and um, a little bit about the, the research and writing process, uh, where the leads took me, the people that I talked to and um, how uh, this evolved over time and where we are right today. Um, hi, Bashan, we welcome you back. You froze there for a little bit. <laughs> uh, I, I shouldn't have told you we haven't had issues with this before. <laughs> so that's completely on me. Right. Um, but it seems like you have it under control. So I started. Would, right. Uh, right. I, I'm going. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so um, this has been uh, a great journey. So about myself, I um, I live in New England and I um, have my MBA. I used to work for an investment bank. And at some point I decided that isn't really what I wanted to do with my life. And I decided to go back to Simmons University in Boston and get a degree in women's history. And it was during that time in the 1990s when I went back to school there. Um, and I um, uh, learned about Fannie Lou Hamer. I had not been aware of her before. And um, there was, you know, she just was amazing to me in, in the studies that I was um, doing at the time. 
I went on to get my PhD and earn my doctorate uh, in American history, specializing in African American history and women's history. And my dissertation was on Harriet Tubman, which became a book. And now we have these national parks to her. Hopefully she'll be on the $20 bill, et cetera. Um, and I went on to write about other American women. I've chosen to write about women because I think there isn't enough written about them in, in um, most of the things that we read in history are about the great men. And I think people of color and women um, certainly uh, don't, are not shared equally on those shelves, the history books in bookstores, libraries, um, in academia. So, um, when it, after I finished my last book on Rosemary Kennedy, um, I decided, you know, I started thinking about what the next book was. And Fannie Lou had always been in the back of my mind. She was always there. And I just never felt there was the right moment to start researching her life. Um, but after Rosemary Kennedy, uh, it was like Hamer just kept knocking at the door and I, I couldn't let her go or she wouldn't let me go. I'm not really sure which, but I decided to start researching her life in more depth. And since the 1990s and early 2000s, when I was going through my graduate programs, there was more work that had been done on her. There's some great literature done by other historians about uh, Hamer. So I started there and then I started diving into the um, primary sources, the historical record. And I'm fortunate because late here in the in the 2000 teens, a lot of materials were opening up that had not been available before. And um, what I was finding just captivated me and I, I could not put it down and I could not walk away from Fannie Lou Hamer. And as a historian, as a women's historian, when I decide to work on a biography, I need to really know that woman. I, I look for the details in women's lives that um, aren't necessarily the focus of male biographies, frankly. Um, but when I start on a subject, I wanna know who my subject's family is, who are her friends. Um, you know, I wanted to know who was Fannie Lou's family? Who were they? What were their names? What were their stories? Um, uh, who, who were her best girlfriends when she was a, a young child, a teenager, an adult woman? Who did she spend her time with? Uh, who did she fall in love with? What was that like? And what was her life like in, in the interior of her? So I, I try to discover that, that information. I was fortunate to be able to talk to family members, friends of Hamer's, um, people that worked with her in the civil rights movement, and I have to say, speaking to not only family members who of course loved Hamer deeply and profoundly, um, the people that knew Tubman, that met her, whether she was on stage or they worked with her in the civil rights movement on a daily basis, or they met her at one moment in their lives while they were involved in the movement, they all talked about the same thing, how unbelievable she was as a human being how she inspired them to do more, to be better, to work harder. And, you know, over the years, I, I would be out giving lectures on any different things. And I would mention that I was working on a biography of, of Fannie Lou Hamer. And invariably, there'd be somebody in the audience that had met her as a college student on a university campus. And they would say, she changed my life that day and I quit school and joined the movement or I finished my degree and I decided to start, you know, working at a lawyer's guild and um, devote myself to the civil rights movement. Uh, she really captured people with her, her profound, um, uh, her voice. She had this amazing voice. She could. She was a, a great speaker. People talk about Martin Luther King, and he was a great speaker. Um, but Fannie Lou Hamer had this amazing voice, and um, raised in a Baptist household with a father who was a part-time preacher, she had that sensibility. So when she talked to an audience, they followed every word, and she. She peppered her, her speeches and her conversations with biblical passages, and she teased out relationships to 
the Bible and its teachings to what was happening during that day. And audiences felt, you know, felt it and were moved by it. And people I met remembered those moments and how it influenced them and affected them and their profound respect for her. I remember interviewing um, some lawyers that worked with her in Mississippi um, in the uh, 1960s and 1970s. And um, it was funny because some of them were laughing and talking about how um, they, they too were thinking about the days that they spent time with her. They'd go to her home in Ruleville, Mississippi to talk about a case. But today they, they have a hard time remembering what that case was because all they can remember was sitting in her presence and being humbled and inspired and overwhelmed by her personality. And um, so this is, you know, 60 years later, 50, 60 years later, these people, these lawyers are still in awe and in wonder of the power of Fannie Lou Hamer and the person that she was. So with that said, let me um, talk a little bit about her life and um, a hope, hopefully it will inspire you to buy the book and read more about her life. Um, she was born in Mississippi, the Mississippi Delta. She was the 20th child of um, Jim and Ella Townsend, who were uh, sharecroppers. They had a very tough life. You know, being a sharecropper was a very, very difficult um, existence. And um, they faced poverty frequently, and it visited their home often. Um, when Fannie Lou was, was born in October of 1917, and as I said, she was the 20th child, seven of her siblings had already died. And in fact, in the four years before she was born, Ella had, had lost four babies. Four babies had died. Um, the, the mortality rate for black children in Mississippi at the time was just horrendous. And, um, and they suffered from lack of access to health care, um, sanitary conditions, good nutrition. Um, so it was, a, it was a very difficult life. Uh, Fannie Lou became her mother's favorite. And you can imagine how Ella must have cherished this baby that survived after losing so many children. And, um, and her, Hamer's siblings talked about how uh, they resented that Fannie Lou Hamer was so spoiled that Ella would not let um, Fannie Lou be punished, for instance. You know, the Baptist father, he was a very strict father and he, you know, physical punishment was a thing for him. Um, but Fannie Lou Hamer escaped that because Ella protected her and would not let her be um, punished. Uh, so she was spoiled, but she also was a bright, engaging child. And um, with her mother at her side, uh, she grew into this amazing uh, young woman and adult. Fannie Lou credited her mother with much of, of her, own, um, her own qualities. She said that she admired her mother. Her mother was incredibly brave, she said. Um, she did everything that she could to have her, help her children survive and to protect them. She tells an interesting story about um, they would, Fannie Lou Hamer started picking cotton when she was six years old. Um, education for black children was minimal at best in Mississippi. Schools were open for them maybe four months out of the year, if that much. And um, they only went up to eighth grade and um, the supplies uh, were just poor. The classrooms were poorly uh, provisioned. Um, they had cast off books from white schools if they had the books at all. So it was, a, it was tough to learn in those schools. Um, so Fannie Lou starts picking cotton um, at the age of six years old. And she observed her mother um, going out into the field with, with buckets, one on her head and one in each hand. And there was one that all, it was, they had their lunches in those buckets and, and um, things. But there was one bucket that Fannie Lou said had uh, a cover on it all the time. And, and being a young girl, she was curious, why did her mother keep bringing this bucket out into the field but not opening it? 
And one day she snuck a peek into the bucket when her mother wasn't looking and it was a nine millimeter Luger. And her mother carried the gun to protect her children from the white bosses who, you know, controlled the labor and the pace of work in those fields. And um, she wanted to be sure that those white bosses didn't grab one of her daughters uh, and take the daughter off and, and do God knows what to the, to the daughter or to protect her sons from being whipped and beaten by these bosses. So uh, the neighbors and the other sharecroppers um, would shake their head and they thought that Ella was crazy because she stood up to white men. And she did experience um, beatings from these men in protecting her children, but um, Fannie Lou admired her mother for standing up and protecting them. So she learned a lot from her mother. She learned a lot from her father too. There was a tremendous amount of, of um, faith and religion in that household. Um, Fannie Lou grew up, you know, knowing the Bible and she, she relied on her faith. She was deeply spiritual and um, that faith of hers that was so strong really helped her survive her poverty, the, the tremendous um, segregation and discrimination and violence in Mississippi that uh, African Americans endured in that very um, uh, racist society um, in, in that area of the country. And so her faith was a rock for her. And um, her father and mother were part of that, you know, being in her in her life. During that, when the Great Depression came, um, her parents were getting older and Fannie Lou had to quit school in sixth grade. And that was hard because she was a very uh, bright child. She loved to learn. She loved to read. And um, she would snatch whatever she could, um, whether they were cleaning uh, the white boss's house and there were magazines and newspapers being thrown away. Fannie Lou would grab them and take them home and read them. Um, or if there were things at the church in the church hall, she would read whatever she could get her hands on to um, just to absorb and be a part of the world and find out what was going on in the world beyond uh, Ruleville, Mississippi, where she and her family uh, lived and were sharecroppers. Uh, her older siblings all ended up moving on and starting their own families and sharecropping as well. And so a lot of the care and support of uh, Fannie Lou's parents during the Great Depression fell onto her. Um, she was an, an older teen and um, getting into her early 20s. And so she had the responsibility of caring for them. Her father died um, in 1939 and her mother was becoming disabled um, from blindness. So uh, Fannie Lou had a lot of responsibility and burdens as a, as a teenager and young adult. Um, when I was doing the research for this, it was a remarkable uh, reading about the poverty and the level of, of racism in Mississippi. And while a lot of this was going on in other Southern states, I, I concentrated on Mississippi because this is where Fannie Lou Hamer grew up and as she said, existed. Um, and they struggled every day to survive. And the violence um, perpetrated by whites against blacks in Mississippi was constant. Mississippi still holds the record for the most lynchings in this country um, throughout its history. Um, it was a form of coercion and intimidation and control. Um, and it was a, a, a violent tool that the white community used sometimes to, um, to make sure that uh, black people stayed in what they believe should be their place and not ask for civil rights, not try to um, improve their situation. So she lived in this environment that was really difficult as, but as I said, her faith supported her and guided her. And, um, and as she got older, she really questioned what was going on and why did, why did they have to tolerate this? There were other black Mississippians who left during the, um, before the Great Depression, during and after to get away from that um, 
oppressive environment and they moved to the north and west where their industries into cities where they could work in factories and um, live different lives than there in uh, the Mississippi Delta and the rural communities. So she grew into this beautiful woman um, and she married a man named Pap Hamer. And um, in 18, 1944, um, as World War II was starting to wind down, and they, um, he was a sharecropper on the W.D. Marlowe plantation outside of Ruleville. And Pap had a special skill. He was a mechanic. He could repair um, uh, farm equipment, uh, mechanize farm machinery. Um, and a lot of the uh, mostly white plantation owners had started to replace their uh, farm labor, their human labor, with machines that would do the plowing and the planting and the um, and the picking and, and things. So the ones that could afford it started buying um, machines and PAP fortunately had the skill. So he had a better status on the plantation than some of the other sharecroppers. So they lived in a home together on the Marlowe plantation and they supplemented their income by making uh, bootleg liquor. Uh, Mississippi had been dry since before prohibition and it stayed dry after prohibition, but it seems like when I was doing my research, everybody had a still in their house and there were little juke houses everywhere where they could serve food and have a little music and, um, and supplement um, their sharecropping income with entertaining and, and making this liquor. Um, and speaking of music, um, Fannie Lou Hamer lived just a few miles from the place that is identified as the birth of the Delta Blues music. And um, so in listening to her voice, she was a, a great singer. She um, it was noted for her powerful voice. And um, she sang a lot of spirituals, of course, in church. Um, but she grew up in this environment where the blues was everywhere. And I interviewed some blues historians who were fabulous. And I'm so grateful to talk to them about the blues tradition there and where it came from and how Hamer could have been influenced. And one of those um, historians, uh, Dr. Mary Williams, told me that um, not only did she feel that Hamer was um, deeply influenced by the blues, although she may not have sung the blues given her Baptist upbringing. Um, she said, quote, that Hamer was, um, lived a blues filled life. And that is so true. And the blues comes out of that landscape, that human and physical landscape in Mississippi. And, um, and this, it, it was infused in Tubman's life too. And I think you can hear it in some of her singing as well. So, she and Pap have this little juke house and they're um, in nearby Ruleville in the town of Ruleville. There was a street called Greasy Street where um, a lot of some of the black businesses were and they there were juke joints there and blue singers would sing there and there'd be singers on the street corners and um, Saturday nights there would be crowds there listening to um, blues artists. So um, try, using that as part of my research and trying to frame Fannie Lou's life and who she was. And, you know, she just wasn't a sharecropper. That wasn't the, the totality of her life. That is what she did. But she had a family and she had friends and a community and a church. And um, that's what, what infused her life. And that's what I researched. I wanted to know about that and, and um, try to explain it and, and convey that in this book. Um, she and Pap um, wanted to have a family of their own. Fanny Lou had come from a, a, a family of 20. Um, and so they wanted to have their own family. She struggled with fertility. She had apparently a couple of miscarriages and a couple, two stillbirths. And it was very, very difficult for her. She and Pab did adopt two young girls um, from the community, uh, Dorothy in uh, 1945 and um, Virgie in 1953. And um, 
they they were their daughters and they raised them in this household and they struggled like other families to put food on the table and take care of their children and educate them and and try to make a better world for them as well. Um, the civil rights movement, which had been you know going on for since the Civil War, um, you know had been percolating along in different parts of the country. Um, in the teens and the 20s and 30s. And after World War II, as some of these black soldiers came home, they had been out in the world fighting for freedom and equality. And um, they come home to a place that told them that they were they couldn't really, they weren't free and they they were not equal. And um, this started to fuel a renewed movement. And in, there were civil rights organizations like the NAACP, um, et cetera, and there were local organizations in Mississippi that were trying to push forward with um, civil rights, but it was hard going in a place like Mississippi. They, the, the, the system, the structure, everything was organized around preventing um, black people from, from uh, voting, First of all, uh, half the population uh, in Mississippi uh, was black and um, only 5% of eligible black voters could vote because of the uh, voting restrictions. There were poll taxes, there were literacy tests, there were all sorts of ways that the, um, the, the white power structure had um, encoded into the Mississippi constitution, in local laws, county laws, uh, to prevent people from actually voting. So there were organizations that were trying to make a difference. They were trying to get better pay for sharecroppers and more equitable contracts so that they would make more at the end of the year and be able to survive the winter. Um, but it was, it was slow going in a place like Mississippi that worked so hard to prevent those things from happening. Um, Hamer did participate in those organizations. Um, later in her life, when she became a public figure, she, she would tell audiences that she wasn't really aware of the civil rights movement until it came to Ruleville, Mississippi in 1962. But that isn't true. She actually was, a, according to interviews, um, interested and part of efforts in Sunflower County in Mississippi to, um, to do some civil rights work. She tried to raise memberships for the NAACP and um, she strategized with local people who were active in a, a local movement. Um, but why she didn't really talk about this as a, a public persona is complicated. And I talk about it a little bit in the book, but she really was eager for change and she wanted to, to, to make a change. And um, in the field, she would talk to people about this isn't right. You know, why are we being treated this way when the the straw boss, the man out in the field that would weigh the cotton that they would pick and he would cheat them because he would use a weight that was altered. So it didn't give an accurate reading of how much pot cotton they were picking. And Fannie Lou Hamer knew that he was using a um, an altered weight. And so um, she wanted to make a change and she tried to exact um, uh, some sort of, uh, she tried to find ways in order to make that happen. And some of her friends and some of her um, fellow share sharecroppers um, were afraid and rightfully so. It was dangerous to, to talk in the fields about, well, we gotta make this better. We have to demand better wages. There were a couple of moments in her life that transformed her from um, a Mississippi sharecropper that was existing, as she would say repeatedly. Um, in 1960, she was suffering from um, fibroids in her uterus, and they were painful. And um, uh, her, the one of the women, the white women um, that she worked for recommended that she go to a doctor in Ruleville who could take care of the fibroids and then perhaps she would have a successful pregnancy. But the doctor ended up sterilizing Fannie Lou Hamer without her permission. When she came out of surgery and was recovering at home, she learned that she had been sterilized and it devastated her. The anger, <clears throat> And the frustration and the the 
<clears throat> total sense of helplessness that she experienced really sent her into a very dark place. Um, <clears throat> with her faith and her family, she came out of that dark place. She never forgot that and she never really let go of that anger, but her faith taught her she had to let go of that anger to move on, which she did do. And she decided, <clears throat> excuse me, in um, 1962, when the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a, a young organization of young people from around the country that arrived in Mississippi to help people register to vote, she decided she would take that chance and, um, <clears throat> and try to register to vote. And by that time, she was, um, you know, in her 30s and, and heading into her 40s. And she still hadn't even registered to vote because she knew that test would be impossible to pass. Even though she had a sixth grade education, she could read and write. She knew that the test was designed so that she would fail. But these young SNCC workers arrived in Ruleville, Mississippi in August of 1962, and they gave her hope. She actually called them, um, she referred to them as the new kingdom. In her mind, she could not believe that these young people, uh, among them uh, Bob Moses, who was a, a, an unbelievable civil rights activist who died uh, very recently, um, he was one of them, and she could not believe that these young people would come into her community and help her try to find a way to register to vote and to vote, to have a voice. And she called them the new kingdom. The new kingdom on earth had arrived to make the world a better place to change it. And she decided she needed to, if they were willing to come and risk um, the violence and the harassment um, then she was going to try to register to vote. Um, she did do that. Um, naturally, she failed when she went to the county courthouse with a group of other Ruleville citizens um, on a, uh, an August day and in 1962. She failed the test. And when she got home, um, she discovered that Mr. Marlowe, the plantation owner, had been ranting and raving around the, <clears throat> the cotton fields that day because he had heard from the court clerk in Indianola, uh, the county seat where Fannie Lou Hamer tried to register to vote, that Fannie Lou had been there and he was furious. And he demanded that she explain herself when she came home and that um, if she wanted to try to vote them, that was not acceptable. He told her that they weren't ready for that in Mississippi. And he said he wanted her to go down to the courthouse the following day and take her registration and tear it up, to retrieve it and tear it up. And she told him no, that she had gone down there to register to vote because she wanted to register to vote for herself, not for him. And he gave her one more opportunity to say that she would tear up the registration and she said no, and she packed her bags that night and was evicted. She left the plantation and the cabin that she shared with her two daughters and Pap. And that set her on this journey to become a civil rights activist. Um, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, their, their goal was to find local leaders. They didn't want these young people to march into communities and tell everybody what to do. Um, they wanted to be there as a resource and to help people um, and to identify leaders that could lead in the community so that people could go and vote for themselves and do for themselves. And they recognized Fannie Lou Hamer was a, a leader very early on. And Bob Moses recruited her to join them. And she did. And she spent... Um, you know, she had made that commitment. It, it was a turning point after, you know, being sterilized without her consent, losing that ability to have her baby and, um, and just sick and tired. She always talked about being sick and tired, um, that she was going to make a difference herself. She had to be the change she wanted to see. And her story evolves from there. And she ends up on the national stage, this incredible voice that represents the poor, the forgotten, 
Um, there was Martin Luther King. There were other great leaders up there. They were well-educated. <clears throat> um, they came, they were elites. Fannie Lou Hamer was not an elite. She was of that earth. She was from that landscape and people resonated with her words and her message and where she had come from and where she wanted everyone to go. And that her voice was as valuable as Dr. Martin Luther King's. Um, so the book tells the story of how she launches into the, the national scene, her impact locally, nationally, and, um, and what she endured in order to have her voice be heard, the violence that she faced and um, the crippling um, uh, effects of violence that she endured um, that eventually contributed to uh, her failing health and her dying in, in 1977. But her work to bring the vote to Mississippi, to change the laws, to influence political leaders around the country on the national level cannot be understated. She had a tremendous impact on the Democratic Party. Um, it was slow going and she was frustrated at the pace of change, but we can link to her movement, her voice, her power, her determination to making the changes so that laws uh, could, were taken off the books. They could no longer bar people from um, voting but through literacy tests and poll taxes, et cetera. And so her legacy lives on in um, the diversity of the Democratic Party. And, um, and interestingly, when I started this book, I did not imagine that her legacy, her story is so important today. There are so many things that I researched that are resurfacing again. The language that we, was used against her and the community and, and then civil rights activism in the 50s and 60s is surfacing again. And so um, I'm looking forward to you all reading the book and thinking about it and being inspired by Fannie Lou Hamer too. So I think we're getting close to um, when we sh I should take some questions. I hope I have questions here. And um, I, you know, I, I hope that you become as inspired by Fannie Lou Hamer as I do. And I think that everyone in this country should know about her. And by the way, um, there are Fannie Lou Hamers today in our communities. Some of them are already surfacing in, in the na on the national level, but look in our own communities. There are women and men, but I'm, I'm talking about women here who are working hard in the communities and they need our support. They need, you might want to do this. You are going to need the support. We need to uh, remember the Fannie Lou Hamers. There's a roadmap there and we can use it and to move things forward in this country um, and to make it fulfill its promise of the Declaration of Independence that all people are created equal and, um, and it, to make this, you know, the greatest democracy in the world. So thank you. And um, I'll take some questions. All right, thank you very much for that, Dr. Larson. We have some questions coming in now. As you've heard, please everyone send your questions in if you would like for them to be asked before the floodgates completely open. Uh, the first question we have here is from Teresa. She asks, do you see any implications for today with the current voter suppression uh, that we are experiencing, i.e. Texas? So I do, and um, of course you can imagine when I started this project a few years ago, I did not imagine that this would actually be playing out. Um, so in 1965, um, President Johnson passed the 1965 Voting Rights Act which eliminated all those barriers to voting. And it set up a commission so that the Southern states um, would be monitored constantly so that they couldn't kind of sneak in these laws and try to keep people from voting again. But in 2013, um, in the Shelby case, the Supreme Court um, sort of struck down portions of that act. So now it, it liberated some of these states so that they can enact some of these voter restriction um, laws, you know, reducing the number of polling sites, reducing the, the hours that people can, can um, vote, 
um, making it more difficult to get absentee ballots, um, making it more difficult to register to vote. If you don't have an ID, then you need to get an ID. But for some people, they may have to travel who knows how many miles. And if they don't have transportation, it's difficult. So yes, and now with the, the Texas laws, some the strictest voter registration laws in the country, voting right laws are there in Texas. And the language, the methods are the same as the 1950s and 60s. So you're gonna see a lot of parallels in my book. Okay. Hey, well. Well, let's go next to this one from Julia. There's another one that's similar to it, but we'll we'll keep it separate. Julie asks, uh, if you could just discuss a little about the research and writing process you had for this book. Um, so the research uh, was, it was hard. This is hard history. It's really difficult history. Reading um, the history of, of violent racism and segregation, um, and it, it, there are tremendous books out there that deal with this history from before the Civil War and after through Reconstruction, Jim Crow, and through the 20th century. Um, and But the primary documents, I became so immersed in the primary documents, particularly the civil rights documents. I have to give a shout out to civil rights workers, the civil rights veterans today who are in their you know, 70s and 80s. And they have been working for decades to make sure that this history is preserved and all of those records are preserved. And through um, the SNCC Legacy Project, the Civil Rights Veterans website, um, there are uh, archives and libraries around the country that hold these archives and they are digitizing them every single day. They are uploading them and putting, putting them on the web so that you can see them and search them by word. I mean, 10 years ago, we didn't have these resources. They're there now. They were there for me and they're there for every American uh, to, to research. So that process was exciting because I could see the internal conversations. I could see the secret files of Mississippi. They have a sovereignty commission, which is like a secret FBI that they had that, that spied on civil rights workers. And there are the reports, they're spying on Fannie Lou Hamer and all these people. Um, so that research is incredible and compelling. And also as, a, as the civil rights veterans aged and um, moved on to other careers, many of them left their own testimony behind. The interview started in the 60s and 70s, right through the 80s, 90s, into the 2000s with the National Museum of African American History and Culture, started their own documentary project in interviewing the surviving civil rights activists. I encourage all of you to try to access those online. They are amazing stories. They're amazing uh, testimonies. Um, and of course, you'll read a lot of that in my book. I mean, I base a lot of my, my the storytelling about Hamer on those interviews and, and Hamer. And also YouTube, I have to give a shout out. Some fabulous people put some of her speeches online and you can see some of them online and the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian also have them online as well. So I encourage you to do that. So it's hard history, it's hard to write, um, but that's why I go so deeply in depth into the context, into Hamer's interior life so I could share everything that I could that happened to her that created the woman she became. So when she becomes that civil rights activist, you all understand how she became that person and how the core of her is rooted in that Delta and her family and the community and her faith. Thanks, Lisa. So, here's a question from an anonymous attendee and I, I briefly touched on this on my uh, introduction before I was kicked out. <laughs> um, and they said, have you visited her grave in hometown? And if so, what was your experience like? So I have not visited her grave in hometown. I had scheduled three different trips to Mississippi. The first one, there was a flood and I, I couldn't go. Uh, flying in, and getting to Jackson, it was a flood and I couldn't go. And then COVID hit and I could not go. So um, it is my my great regret that I was not able to go to her gravesite. Um, but you know, when I when things are better in Mississippi, 
and um, the cases are not so high there and it's safer to go, I, I want to make a pilgrimage there and, and visit her grave and um, just take in that, that landscape. So here's, a, here's one from Jean. Um, and she's, or, well, not she, she, but they're asking if, um, if you're aware if the Black leadership within uh, the civil rights movement are you aware of if they were accepting of Ms. Hamer's presence or if there was some sort of uh, hesitancy? Yeah, so I talk about this at length because you can't talk about Hamer and the civil rights movement without talking about the is issues of class. Um, she was a um, Mississippi sharecropper with a sixth grade education and those elites, black and white elites in the movement um, did not really value her voice as it should have been valued. And she felt the sting of that uh, often, but she did the work and she spoke to people that those elites did not reach. And um, they were impatient with her, her uh, the way she talked um, and her folksiness sometimes. They disrespected her. Most of it, they were male elites and they did not value women in general um, in the civil rights movement. They did not have leadership roles in the way that men did or in the way women have leadership roles today. So she suffered from that and it, it wounded her and she talked about it a lot. And in the research, it's plain. They have meetings, the meeting notes in these civil rights organizations and they do say unkind things about Hamer, and she struggles with that when she hears that or she feels it. And some of them um, are outright critical of her and tell her that she has no place being a leader in the movement. So um, those issues were glaring at the time, and I do talk about it in the book. I do. I, I was going to make that a two-part question because Jim asked something closely related to that. So I'll just tack this on with what you were just saying. Jim wanted to know um, if along with a lot of that kind of class discrimination, if there was actually any outright jealousy, um, maybe from an elite uh, who, who's looking at her, you know, is not so elite. Um, I, I, yes, I would imagine that there was jealousy and um, the, it was the people were territorial as well. So um, it's like, don't you step in my lane. I'm not going to step in yours, which was her. That's what she viewed as a problem that, you know, what are these lanes and that everybody needed to be lifted up and um, she needed the elites to pay attention to the, the crisis for people like her, the poverty, the lack of access to education and healthcare uh, and good nutrition, those were parts of the civil rights movement too. And, and voting rights was important, but every single day someone needed to be fed and um, they had diseases and illnesses that needed to be treated. And so, and the violence, the violence had to end. And so it, there's also the issue of, of nonviolence Fannie Lou Hamer believed in nonviolence, but at the same time, she had great understanding and sympathy for these young civil rights activists who became radicalized and decided that they were going to fight violence with violence. And so there was a divide there in the movement as well, but she understood that because she carried that anger with her. And even though her faith told her that she had to forgive, mm, she wasn't quite going to forgive, but she was going to move on and try to make change and make the people who hated her change. And, and some of them did, some of them had to admit that they respected what she did and how she did it because she just did not stop. She just, at one point, um, she just, someone said to her, you know, Fannie Lou, be careful, you're going to get killed. And she said something to the effect of, they've been trying to kill me my whole life. You know, what's the difference? So she was very pragmatic, very pragmatic. Well, that, that's a, a sort of good segue into this next question from Jan. And Jan wanted to know if you, are you aware of 
what ways the murder of Medgar Evers may have affected Fannie Lou Hamer? Well, uh, it, it deeply and profoundly affected her. Fannie Lou Hamer was actually uh, in jail in Winona, Mississippi, where she had been uh, taken on while well, she was coming back from a voter registration education workshop in Georgia. And um, she had been arrested with other fellow SNCC workers and brutally beaten and assaulted in the jail. And um, when she finally was bailed out by um, civil rights workers um, from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, um, they told her she was released on the afternoon after he was murdered. And they told her in the car back to um, Greenwood, Mississippi, and it devastated her. And she had barely survived the beating in the jail and to come out and find out that this leader in Mississippi had been murdered. It was, it was, she was bearing those physical and psychological blows barely, and this landed very hard on her at the time. So here's a question from Eleanor. She wants to know if you can talk about her most shining moment, uh, which would be Democratic Convention, question mark, in some <laughs> detail. Um, so I go into great detail about this in the book, and I, I, I hope you buy it and read it because it is, so watching the videos, whatever you can get the glimpses of on YouTube, because a lot of them have been pulled down because NBC now is charging for you to look at it. Um, but it's amazing her presentation. She was um, part of a newly formed Mississippi Democratic Freedom, Freedom Democratic Party that she and other civil rights activists had created in Mississippi in 1963 and 1964. And they decided that they were going to challenge the seating of the regular all white Mississippi Democratic delegation at the Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City in New Jersey in August of 1964. So she goes and they have to place their challenge in front of what's called the credentials committee to convince the committee that they are the ones, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party should be the ones that represent Mississippi, not the all white party that wouldn't let them vote. And so different civil rights activists from Mississippi and Dr. Martin Luther King gave testimony in support of this cause. And then Fannie Lou Hamer gets up and she makes her way over to the desk and she sits down. She's wearing a borrowed dress um, and she's nervous, but the Mississippi delegation is sitting in the con uh, convention hall room in front of her and she stares them down. The other people that had spoken read from notes, prepared notes, but Fannie Lou Hamer spoke from her heart and she told everybody her name and where she lived. It was like telling the world, this is where I live. If you're gonna come kill me, come kill me. And she told the audience about um, her life in Mississippi, not being able to vote, the beating that she endured in the Winona jail. And she ends her speech with um, this quote that she questions America, she says, in fact, let me just get this for you. I'd love to read it for you. Um, she said, is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off the hooks because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America? Her testimony was so powerful, people in the room, black and white, were crying. President Johnson was watching from the White House what was going on the proceedings because the news coverage was live. When she, he started to hear her testimony, she was so powerful so quickly that she, he called a impromptu news conference to preempt the rest of her speech. And of course, NBC News says, oh, we've got to switch to the White House. The President Johnson has an announcement. They switch to him and he's like, Hi, oh, I just want to remind you that it's the, you know, it's been a year and so many months and so many days and so many hours since President Kennedy was shot. 
thank you very much. And then he ends it and leaves. They go back to the convention hall, but Fannie Lou Hamer has completed her speech. So he feels that he's preempted what was a really powerful speech. What he didn't know is that NBC had continued to tape coverage of it and they replayed it that night on national television. So people saw her testimony and she changed the world. She really did. She didn't get what she wanted, what the Mississippians wanted, the black Mississippians and the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party wanted was to represent Mississippi in 1964 at the convention. Um, but they were there in 1968 because of Fannie Lou Hamer. She was so powerful and so amazing. And um, I was speaking to a radio host today who was 12 years old when she gave that speech. And he remembers his mother calling him and his siblings into their living room to watch that testimony. And here he is now 70 years old and he, he'll never forget watching that testimony. Wow, that, that, that's a powerful story. Um, so I'll, I'll give you this one. This is kind of open-ended here. Um, this is from Cassie. She's wondering if, in your opinion, if Ms. Hamer were alive today, what do you think, or what would you see her role being, I guess, in where we are today with society? Um, so I think she'd still be doing much of the same thing. She'd still be um, fighting that voter registration, that the voter rights um, issue. She would still be there. She would be supporting the younger activists rising up today. Um, she advocated actually for universal preschool education back in the 60s and 70s. She would still be campaigning for that. Um, she would be uh, still pushing for you know, universal health care, access to equal access to, to all education and um, you know, to, to, for people to live in dignity and respect and equality. She would probably be pretty amazed, um, maybe, actually, maybe not, given her life experience, but she would never have stopped campaigning. Her life was cut short, unfortunately, but I could see that Fannie Lou Hamer today would be doing the exact same thing she was doing back in the 60s and 70s. So we have a, a few moments here. I'm going to try to squeeze in two questions, but this first one I'll try to do real quick. Um, and that's just, uh, in short, are there any other people, be it from uh, this era that from Ms. Hamer's time period or not, are there any other people you see yourself on the horizon wanting to do research and give attention to, possibly even write another book? <laughs> Um, I am I'm giving thought to other um, mid 20th century uh, activists, um, but I'm not ready to talk about it yet. I have to let, you know, I've got to let it settle and someone has to keep, you know, knocking at me or, you know, someone that I can't let go and I, I'm getting there. So we'll see. Soon I'll be able to talk about the next project. But right now, Fannie Lou has my heart, and that's really who I want to talk about. <laughs> Understood. That, 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 the feel has to be right. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Anybody, any writers out there, it has to, you have to feel it. You have to have a passion for it because there are long, dark days of doing research, and writing is frustrating. You have to love that subject. For me, I have to love that person I'm writing about. So I, uh, hopefully not selfishly, but I'm going to take the last question. And that is just a question that we ask of all of our uh, authors and participants. And that is, if there's anything you are currently reading, uh, could you please share that with everyone? And I'll just add to it. Or if there's anything you would like to begin to read, could you just share that with everyone so they can kind of see where you're headed. Oh, I have about 10 books here. But I, <laughs> actually, I would say 20. Um, oh, they range from <laughs> um, the slavery era. There's some incredible books that have come out um, about the antebellum period and um, 
uh, slavery, uh, enslaved women, and um, and then into the 20th century, there are so many books coming out about the civil rights movement. And I, you know, uh, we're so fortunate that there's such rich material out there and there are amazing authors writing and sharing these stories. So we can have these conversations about race and its role in our country and our society. And um, we can only have those honest conversations um, by reading this scholarship. And so I know you can find a lot of those books there at Politics and Prose for sure. And of course, um, some copies of your book, Walk With Me, which we again encourage everyone to buy. Hey, buy multiple copies, give some as a gift. <laughs> you know, um, it never would hurt to learn about an uh, under, uh, you don't hear much about Miss Hamer. So, it would be good to tell everyone about her, uh, spread the word, because she is certainly uh, a figure that deserves much more attention than she gets. Mm. Well, on behalf of Politics and Prose, I would like to thank you, Dr. Larson, for this wonderful uh, event. I'd like, of course, to thank everyone who has joined us, our guests, our audience here, who hopefully your patronage uh, continues to allow us to bring you more of these events. And on behalf of Politics and Pros, I'd like to say to everyone, stay well and stay well read. Thank you very much, Dr. Larson. Thank you, Rashawn. Have a good evening. Thank you.